Hello and welcome to another episode of Into the Scriptures. My name is Wesley Vital, and today we're going to talk about the fear of outreach. Now, what am I talking about fear of out- outreach? Well, I was inspired to do this study because um, on December 12th, it was, a, it was a Saturday, a Shabbat or a Sabbath, and we went to this Trump rally in Washington, D.C. There was uh, apparently thousands of individuals, and we went there on the specific uh, agenda of passing out Bible study booklet and scriptures. So we wanted to uh, to give out as many booklets and books possibly can talking about prophecy, early church history, talking about the law of God, uh, talking about uh, some other questions and answers of Christian faith. So we really was passing out that material and it was blessed. Um, but this study uh, came came about because of what we were doing. It was it was me and five other individuals, and we our team alone was able to pass out thirty four hundred ma- uh, books, materials, and studies. So that was a blessing, and it was more than just our team. So if our team alone was able to get rid of sixty five boxes with fifty two uh, books and materials in it. And that's about 3,400 right there. And where the and there was other groups as well. There was a great blessing of passing out. Even in the trash when I went to look, there wasn't much. But that's what this study was uh, inspired by. Because there's a fear out there of outreach where individuals are scared to to share the gospel or, or, or to share a study or to share material out there with other individuals. And I do understand that. Even myself had uh, these issues and even now. I get nervous before, even when I'm going to have a Bible study, I'm going to lead out on a Bible study, or I'm going to sit and, and, and teach a whole bunch of people, uh, or if I'm on the street preaching on the street, I get nervous. I do get nervous, and that is the flesh. That's the flesh trying to scare me. But with victory, with a lot of victory in the in the Messiah, he gives me strength so that I can continue on, and, and the nervousness goes away. So that's what this was inspired by the fear of outreach. And we're going to talk about that because it's very important that we understand that we're all called to do this work. We're all called to outreach. So uh, let's, let's get in it and I'll give some examples of what actually happened uh, on December 12th during uh, us passing out the materials that we've actually experienced some things that were bad and that were good. So let's get into it. So we know that in scripture, we're called to give the message. We are called to preach the gospel. So let's go to the most obvious. I like it straight down to the point. It's in the book of Mark chapter 16, verse 15. And this is the Messiah making it very clear. Okay. Very clear that the gospel is to be preached. All right. So it says, and he said, go ye into all the world. And preach the gospel to every creature. So he's talking about his disciples, okay, the people who's following him to go and preach to all the world. Okay, so this is a direct command from the Messiah, okay, to his followers. So let's let's get that out of the way, because that's the most obvious. We are called to give the message. We are called to go out to people. We're not called to just sit down and keep to ourselves. When we have this gift, okay, and in Scripture we're referred to uh, when we accept the Messiah, we have the Father and His Son in us, we, and His their Spirit abides inside of us. We become a flowing stream, a river, a mountain flowing with water, and that water overflows to other things as well. So, when I look at us as an individual, we're not called to just sit down, okay, and not allow that water to flow. I don't know about you, but in my experience, when I started learning of uh, a truth in Scripture and started to see certain things that I that I had was wrong, and now in Scripture showed me the truth, I was so excited, not just for myself, but also to tell my family, my friends, the people around me, and. That was just what I see now is a natural occurrence in a in in a, a Christian walk. Uh, when you're first starting your walk, I, I find many of my my brothers and sisters now that went through the same thing. When they find out this truth, or when the Father calls out to them, what do they do? They always open their mouth to other individuals. They don't bottle it in. And to be completely honest, I believe that the Bible is very clear 
that at that point, if you're not hot or cold for the Messiah, you're just comfortable sitting there and not really open your mouth, but you're not really saying anything against. You're lukewarm, and the scripture is very clear in Revelation that it will spit you out. So let's let's continue. Let's let's always solidify stuff with two or three witnesses because there's there's a bunch of uh, scripture uh, out there, and we're we're just going to touch the main things just to get the point solidified. So in Second Corinthians chapter five. And it's 17 to 20. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 17 to 20. And the reason why I'm pointing this out um, is because it's really important because we were given this message. Okay. We were given this ministry, just like the Messiah had this ministry, just like John the Baptist had this ministry, just like the prophets of old had this ministry. So let's see what ministry this is. This is the message we're preaching. Therefore, if any man be in the Messiah or Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new and all things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Yeshua, the Messiah or Jesus Christ and hath given to us the ministry. Let me say that again. Hath given us the ministry of reconciliation. Okay. Given us the ministry of reconciliation to wit that God was in the Messiah, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Verse 20, Now then, we are ambassadors of the Messiah, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in the Messiah's stead, be ye reconciled to God. So, a lot of information in here. A lot of information, but let me just make sure and point out in verse 18, he has given us the ministry of reconciliation because the Messiah was reconciling us to God and reconciliation is repentance, atonement. That's what reconciliation is. Reconciliation is a turning back to. So this message, this, this ministry has been, been more than just the Messiah. The Messiah is the one who solidified everything and has given it to us. But it has been something that we were supposed to be doing. You have all the prophets, every single one of them, preaching repentance. What did Moses preach? Go to God. What did Jeremiah preach? Repent and go to God. What did, what did uh, uh, Ezekiel preach? Repent and go to God. You have every single prophet of old preaching this same message of reconciliation, of returning to the Father, repenting back to the Father. You have John the Baptist. What did John the Baptist preach? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So this message is the same exact message that's always been preached. And here you have the Messiah now giving us this message and making it very clear through Paul that we are given this message. Just like how the Messiah says, go into all the world and preach the gospel. This is the gospel, the message of reconciliation, the reconciliation, the message of grace, mercy, judgment, the message of how we can come to the Messiah, find mercy, forgiveness through the grace he has given. And now in enter into likeness of his death to raise in the likeness of his resurrection so that we can now live the life that he had of perfection, a purity. This is the message. This is the gospel we need to be preaching. So you have here very clear that we have this message, this ministry of reconciliation. And we're, we are ambassadors, okay? Ambassadors for the Messiah. Now, I want to bring up that word ambassadors because a lot of people, I've heard some, uh, represent, uh, some, some, some diverse meanings that I don't, I, don't, I don't like. But it's very important that ambassadors in greek okay ambassadors in greek i'm not even going to pronounce the name because it's i well i'll try it's uh press b o o press b o press b o which is g4243 in the strongs but in greek it means a representative you are a representative also known as preacher you are representative or preacher or minister for the messiah or for Christ. This is what we are given. This is this is why it's so important that we all should be practicing outreach. We all should be reaching individuals any way possible because we are called to give this message. We are called. Let's look at this. There's there's some parables that the Messiah uses, okay? In the uh, book of Luke and the book of Matthew. So we're going to go to the book of Luke first. But it's very important that we understand this message. Okay. So let's look at these parables because this parables also throws in some key details. 
So Luke chapter 14, Luke chapter 14, and it's 16 to 24. Luke chapter 14, 16 to 24. Now it's important. The focus here is the parable shows. Well, actually, we'll read the parable first. Okay. It says, then said he unto him, a certain man made a great supper and bade many and sent his servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden, Come, for all things are ready. And they all, with one consent, began to make excuses. The first said unto him, I have, I have bought a piece of ground, and I must needs to go see it real quick. I pray thee, have me excused. Verse 19, And another said, I have, I have brought five yoke of oxen, and I go to prove them. I pray thee, have me excused. And another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. Verse 21. So that that servant came and showed his master these things. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city, and bring in hither the poor and the maimed, and, and the halt, and the blind. And the servant said, Master, it is done as thou hast commanded, and yet there is room. So... Before we continue to 23, 24, we have this uh, master who made a supper, right? So he made this supper and he's inviting individuals to come in. Now, the people that were supposed to come had excuses when he sent the servant out. Now, it's important that we all know that he sent a servant. This is a parable as the Messiah is sending us. He sent his servant or his representative to gather people in like we are to gather people in. Now you're going to have people just like this parable is going to have excuses. Now at the, I will tell you one excuse. Actually, I'll tell you two excuses during the passing out the material out in Washington, DC. Uh, there was a individual I was trying to give a book to. I, I, I meant, I said, Hey, how you doing, sir? I just passing out some Bible study material talking about early church history and talking about the law of God. I was wondering if you're interested. It's absolutely free. And he said, no, thank you. I'm a pastor. Save it for someone else. So I can understand his position, but at the same time, as a pastor, as a leader of the flock, uh, you should actually look into and follow what the scripture says, prove all things. You should test all things, because what if the material I was giving will enhance what he already believes or shines light in something he's already studying or reveals error that he believes in so that he can see truth? But and as a leader, he should display such example and also bring it to his fold. Uh, If that is the case, Uh, but sadly, this was an excuse used not to receive any Bible study material. Neither talked to me as well. It was more of a brushing off, kept walking type uh, situation. Um, But just like here in the parable there, people are going to make excuses all day. We had another individual uh, we walked and tried to give a book to. And the exact word was, no, thank you. I follow someone already. I don't need the book. So that's an excuse. Uh, So here again, so don't be disheartened about that. The parable is very clear by including that. It also shows the state of the individuals. Now, in this parable, it's even worse because the individuals that were supposed to come to the supper were the ones making excuses. And then he then the master of the house sent out the servant again, but this time to other people. And he said to go to the street, the lanes of the city, the poor, the maimed, you know, everyone, the blind to come in. And there was still room. And it was sad that the people who were supposed to be there wasn't there. And again, it was the same thing when you're going out and doing some outreach. Sometimes it will be sad to see the people who call themselves Christians or followers of the Messiah or or anything. It's sad to see those who call themselves by that name or claim to be a follower and have a bunch of excuses of not or reasons why not to do outreach, reasons why not to study, reasons why uh, so on and so forth. You, you get what I'm saying. So this parable is very strong. Uh, but here we have the master again sending out people and there's still room. So let's get to verse 23. It says, And the master said unto the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. In verse 24, it says, For I say unto you that none of these men which were bidden shall taste my supper. So now he's sending the servant out again to get more people to fit into this room so that it will be filled. And the master is making it very clear that, you know, those who reject this call, uh, they're not going to be able to taste the supper. Uh, Those who are told to come, they're not going to taste the supper. So uh, when 
in in this parable, I like to compare it as first, you have the masters and it's like the Messiah sending out a servant or a representative or a teacher or a minister, just like in our. So we, we are called to give this message or to give the message. But we also have the examples of people will give excuses, especially those who proclaim to be followers, who claim to be devote followers of the Messiah. And you're going to have uh, other individuals who you least expect, at least expect to be more accepting to the to the message or material. For instance, uh, another example, we were there all day and in Washington, D.C., and there was an individual that I just happened to walk by. And this this individual uh, was Greek Orthodox, uh, 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 Greek Catholic Orthodox or Greek Orthodox Catholic. I'm probably saying that wrong exactly. Uh, uh, but uh, he was the first Greek Orthodox I've ever met uh, before. And I didn't know, but when I came up giving material, uh, in my experience, I found that some individuals, especially in the or- in an Orthodox Catholic uh, like an Eastern Orthodox, stuff like that. I find them more uh, apprehensive when giving out material, which is fine. Um, I, I'm not saying anything bad about that. I'm just saying what I've, what I've experienced. It's not the same with everyone. Um, but here I had a Greek Orthodox Catholic, and he was more than welcome to, re- to, to receive a conversation. We talked for 40 plus minutes uh, on, on certain issues that I might have or he might have with with. Uh, the faith we were exchanging, such as some scripture verses, talking about infant baptism, uh, going into some other things. Uh, But it was so good to see that. And I would expect more from someone who is a professed Christian than someone who is uh, uh, a Catholic. Now, I say that statement uh, because by definition, a Catholic isn't a Christian. Um, The Christian wasn't given that to them until Constantine made the term Christian dumb. When they coined that term Christian dumb, which is now used widely, that was uh, the opportunity needed so that the Catholic church can receive that title as long as everyone else as Christians. Um, But aside that fact, uh, again, you'd be surprised to who you might know that will accept this message. Uh, and you would never know. As sometimes the person you think that was supposed to be there, for instance, uh, a Jew, okay, in this case, a Jew, the Jews, they didn't accept the Messiah here. They rejected the Messiah. They killed the Messiah. And they were bidden to come, but they didn't come. And they should have known better. They had more at that time. They had the scripture. They had the law. And here they are rejecting rejecting the Messiah completely. So you'd be surprised who will accept the material or not. But here you have a perfect example of a master or the Messiah sending out a servant. Let's look at another parable, Matthew 25. And we're going to go all the way to uh, 30. Okay. It says, For the kingdom of heaven is, is, is as a man traveling into a far country, who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. And unto one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one. To every man according to his se- uh, sever- uh, several ability, and straight wo- straightway took his journey. 16. Then he that had received five talents went and traded with the same, and made them other five talents. And likewise he that had received two, he also may- may- uh, gained another two. But he that hath received one went and digged it in the earth and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the master of those servants came and reckoned with them. And so he that hath received five talents came and brought forth five talents, saying, Master, thou deliverest unto me five talents. Behold, I have gained thee five more. His master said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things." Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Verse 22. He also that hath received two talents came and said, Master, thou deliverest unto me two talents. Behold, I have gained two more talents beside them. Verse 23. His master said unto him, Well done, and good and faithful uh, servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy master. 24. Then he said, Then which he had received the one talent came and said, Master, 
I knew that thou art a hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown, and gathering where thou hast not strawed. And I was afraid, and went and hid thy talent in the earth. Lo, there thou hast that is thine. The, his, his master answered and sent it to him, Thou wicked and slothful servant, thou knowest that I reap where I sow not, and gather where I have not strawed. Thou oughtest, therefore, to have put my money to the exchangers, and then, at my coming, I should have received my own with ushery. Take, therefore, the talent from him, and give it unto him which hath ten talents. For unto every one that hath shall be given, and he shall have abundance. But from him that hath not shall be taken away even that which is which he hath. And cast ye the unprofitable servant unto the outer darkness. Therefore shall the weeping and garnishing of teeth. This parable is ridiculously powerful. Okay? Absolutely powerful. So you have this master and he has these servants. Three servants. Each servant was given something. Each servant was given something and two of them thought it went out and got more while one sat and did nothing. This is giving the message. We are given a message. We are given truth in scripture. It is our duty, just like being the representatives or preachers or ministers for the Messiah. We are to go out and multiply. We are to go out and make disciples upon, upon every nation. This is what we are to do. We, should, we cannot be that individual in this parable with the one talent and sat and did nothing. Because now you see the outcome of that. You see the outcome of the master. The master threw him out into utter darkness. Took his talent away. So when we receive the truth and receive the spirit, let's not sit on it and keep it to ourselves. Let's give it to others. Let it flow and give it to others. Do not be this individual with one talent. This is why it's important not to fear outreach. And 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 extremely important that we should be like these servants, the two servants who went out and got more. We should go out. So, with that being said, okay? There's some aspects that people worry about, okay? We worry about rejection when we go and do outreach. That's uh, something else we fear about. All right, because we now we know through scripture, we are supposed to go out. We're not supposed to be sitting on this. We're supposed to work. We're supposed to give this message just like the scripture tells us to do. So here's an aspect. We worry about rejection. Okay. I mean, scripture is pretty clear. So let's just let scripture say it. John 15, 18 and 19. And I have uh, uh, three witnesses for this. And there's a lot more, but. Let's get down to the nitty gritty, the ones that just tell you the detail. So that way we can move on to the next part of why individuals are, are fearful of outreach. So here's an individual. So people worry about rejection. We shouldn't worry about rejection. Okay. John chapter 15, verse 18 and 19 clearly says, if the world hate you, you know that it hateth me before you. Verse 19, if you were of the world, the world would love his own. But because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. So the Messiah's words are always the best. First off, there's other parts of scripture, which we're going to read, that also connects with this as well. So this isn't just for the disciples, the 12 that he had on hand over here. Okay. This isn't referring to that. This is everyone who's his disciples. Okay. This is applied to everyone. And we're going to see that uh, in First John. But check this out. So first off, the, the Messiah is like, don't be surprised that these individuals are going to hate you because they hated me. So don't be surprised you're going to be rejected and hated or even persecuted because they're going to per look what they did to the Messiah. Don't be surprised. And also keep in mind in verse 19, it says, if you were of the world, then the world's going to love you. They'll love their own. But here's the deal. You're not of the world. You're not. You're absolutely not. When you when you go to the Messiah, when you ask for forgiveness, when you, when you invite him into your life, into your heart, and you take the waters of baptism, at your, it says you are a brand new creature. You are a brand new creature. Brand new creature. What does that mean? The life that you now live is the life of the Messiah. That's what Romans chapter 6 says. That's what Paul is indicating. It's not, it, what Paul says exactly, it's not I that live. But him that liveth in me. So that's why it's so important that we understand that we're not a part of this world. And that's why the world is not going to love us when we're doing this. 
and it and it, it's so clear in this ver- in, in this verse by the by the messiah but let's go to another one let's go to first john chapter 3 verse 1 first john chapter 3 verse 1 it said behold what manner of love the father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of elohim or god therefore the world knoweth us not because it knew him not so here again, First John chapter three verse one, the world's not supposed to know us. We are sons of God. That's not a, that's a whole new creature. It's very important that we understand that that these individuals are going to reject us. They are going to persecute us. They are going to hate us. Some will do these things. This is not to be worried about. The scripture says not to be worried about this. In this same chapter, in First John chapter three. If you go all the way to verse 13, it's very clear. It says, Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hate you. Be not surprised. That's what the word marvel means, surprised. Don't be surprised that this is going to happen. Don't worry about it. This is what I translate this from. Don't worry about this. If the world hates you, rejects you, persecute, just remember the Messiah was persecuted. Think about it. All the prophets of old. Every one of them, all the way through the disciples, the apostles, the ones ministering in the New Testament, uh, Philip, all of them, all of them were persecuted. All of them were rejected. Some of them were killed. Some of them were rejected by their very own and rejected outside by the Gentiles as well, which we see. So don't be surprised. The scripture is very clear in verse 13. Marvel not. Marvel not. Let's go to another witness here. Matthew chapter 5, verse 11. It says, Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Blessed are you. Don't worry about rejection. Don't worry about the persecution Don't uh, that they're going to give you. Don't worry about the hate they're going to have towards you. Don't be surprised. But remember that you are blessed. The Father is with you. He'll strengthen you. He'll protect you. He'll guide you. He'll bless you. Don't marvel because of these things. Don't worry about them. Don't let this be a bar or or, or a prison cell where you will never get out to go do outreach because you're worrying about these things. This shouldn't be something we should be worrying about. Of course, we get nervous, but we need to ask the Messiah, don't let our nervousness get in the way of doing his work. Don't let it get in the way of doing his work. I, For example, I'm going to give you one. Um, uh, uh, at, uh, when we were in Washington, D.C. on December 12th and we were passing all the books, right off the bat, right when we were taking books, I was putting them in the backpack with a couple others and we were about to just go out and walk out and then come back and refill. Uh, an individual completely dressed in Jewish attire. I'm talking about he had a shofar. Um, I loved his shofar. I mean, it was the exact same size as the one I had. Um, he had the the prayer shawl, the zit seats. Um, he even had uh, like a little bracelet that connects the prayer shawl with the Ten Commandments on it written. And he came up and he just, I kid you not, the yelling, no hello, no, who are you? What are you doing? It was sheer yelling of why are you passing out study material? You should not be passing out these books and studies. You should be passing out Bibles alone. You have no right to pass out. But Bi- and I kid you not, this individual went out of their way to do that, saying all manner of things to 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 make us or provoke us which thank thank the thank the father that that didn't happen that we were not provoked well of course we tried i i went personally and tried to speak to this individual to calm him down to see if we can have a rational discussion about what's going on and why he thinks uh what we're doing was bad and uh there was no talking there was literally just hey what's your name uh i forgot exactly what his name he said a hebraic name uh or hebrew name and it was just after that, right after telling me his name, I said, I didn't quite hear it. So I asked again and he didn't answer, but he went straight to you guys are sinning because you're giving these books. You guys are not being blessed. You guys are evil. Uh, mouths of the serpent. And, you know, we ended right there and I didn't want to waste too much time uh, because there's other people who wants to hear the truth and pass out the books. We just got there. So we just started walk along and this individual was following following everywhere we were going yelling behind 
yelling behind. We had two two uh, younger youth people with us, uh, all under the age of 15 or 16, two of them. And he was following them, yelling, yelling to everyone to hear around them. These books they're passing out is evil. These books they're passing out is false doctrine. These these studies. And he's just going off, going off and following around everywhere we were going, each little uh, split we did. And as we were passing, uh, a complete stranger came up and she veered into this guy and said, uh, well, veered into us and said, w- w- why is he doing this? And we explained we're just passing out books. And uh, she said, why is he upset then? And we're like, we have no clue. He just doesn't like that we're passing out these material and he doesn't want to talk. He just wants to yell. So this complete stranger said, you're doing the right thing. Keep going. And she went and talked to this guy and after that point, that man never followed us for the rest of the day. And so I see that as a blessing from the father to to remove that evil, evil spirit. Uh, because in reality, that's exactly what happened in the in the book of Acts. Uh, a woman possessed followed Paul and, and did the same thing. So don't be surprised. The scripture says that people will do this. They will say evil against you. They will persecute you. Just like this individual in my experience, uh, this Sabbath that I had, uh, the earlier Sabbath that I had, they said all manner of things. They didn't even know who I was or what I was passing out. Never even asked the material I had in my hand. So uh, this this is going to happen, but don't be discouraged by it. And when it does happen in our situation, don't be provoked. Pray for that individual. Pray for them. Because what happened is, what they're doing is persecuting not you. They're persecuting against the father and his son. So pray for them. Feel bad for them. Don't be provoked by them. Don't waste your time. Try to have an open conversation if that doesn't work with reason. Of course, according to scripture, with the spirit of the Messiah and his character, don't don't waste your time. Keep going. There's other people who needs to, to hear. And God will send a stranger. In my case, I'm thinking it's an angel because she just came out of nowhere said what we were doing is good and went and got this guy off of us. So stuff like that happens. So don't worry about these things. The father will take care of you. The father will take care of you. And another thing that we worry about when it comes to um, outreach, and this is why we also have uh, individuals have fear for outreach as well, is what do you say, right? I mean, I, even I myself have that situation. It's like, what do I say, father? And I have good news for you. The scripture is very clear. It's very clear. It doesn't matter what you what you have to say. The Father is going to say it for you. He will give you the words. That's what scripture says. He will give you the words. Let's look at it. Isaiah 50 verse 4. And there's a bunch. A bunch. Uh, but you know what? Let's just go through a couple. Okay? To save some time. So Isaiah 50 verse 4. It says, And Yahuwah God... Or the Lord God hath given me the tongue of the learned that I should know how to speak a word in season to him that is weary. He that walketh morning by morning. He that walketh my ear to hear as the learned. Now, this is what's crazy. Who gave it to you? The Father hath given me the tongue. Yahuwah, the Lord God hath given me the tongue of the learned. It's not, you don't have to speak the most eloquent uh, uh, sophisticated words and no but the father is going to give you the words to say he's going to give you the words to say you don't have to be eloquent of speech at all look at some verses with eloquent eloquent of speech right paul is probably the most best example because he says it right off the bat okay so first corinthians chapter 2 verse 1 all the way to verse 5 it says And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom. Ooh, you heard that? Heard that? Let me say it again. And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. Let's do verse 2. For I determined not to know anything among you, save Yeshua the Messiah, or Jesus Christ, and him crucified. And I was with you in meekness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of men's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. So Paul's amazing. His words, his words was not 
Was not men's wisdom big words, learned words that you can get from a a thesaurus? Well, man, now I'm saying that wrong. Thesaurus. Like, his words were simple. Absolutely simple. He did not demonstrate. He did not say enticing words. This is Paul saying this in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 all the way to 5, 1 to 5. He's saying he's speaking simple. So we don't need to worry about sounding sophisticated and giving out the best words so that we can attract people and stuff like that. We don't need to do that. I see a lot of preachers today and ministers, they do exactly what I just did a second ago. They start giving that, uh, you know, like that that interest rate, like pulling them in and God wants you, stuff like that. They're using enticing ways of speech when you don't need that. Just give the plain scripture, give the context and understanding of scripture, just like Paul did. You don't need to have big words, uh, anything like that. You don't need it, period. Let's, let's go through some more scripture here. Let's go to Matthew, Matthew chapter 10, Matthew chapter 10 is 18 to 20. And it says, And ye shall be brought before governors and kings for my sake, for a testimony against them and the Gentiles. But when they deliver you up, take no thought how or what ye shall speak, for it shall be given you in that same hour what you shall say. For it is not you that speak, but the Spirit of your Father which speaketh in you. From the Messiah himself from the Messiah himself. Let's take no thought to what we're going to say. He will give you, the Father will give you the words to speak. The Father will give you the words to speak. It is very important that we understand that. Why are we so worried? And I even label this myself at first. Why am I, are we so worried about what we're going to say when the scripture says not to? Not to. An example, you know how I prepare these studies? I just write verses down and have a list of verses and then I just say the verses and whatever comes to mind with other verses and context and everything, then that's what's said. But that's how we should be. We should stop trying to be smart in how we sound and just deliver the pure word of God because it's not our words. These are not our words. The words in scripture are not ours. These are God's words. So let's deliver these words. These words itself has power. No need for big words. No need for labeling. No need to, to draw people in, in, in an emotional way when you're trying to speak. Uh, because most individuals do that nowadays. To draw more attention, they use the emotional aspect of, of motivational speaking or speaking in a certain way where the individual gets uh, motivation, uh, they're you know attached to you or entertained. So that they're, you don't need that. Just give the pure word of God and let God work. Let God work. You don't need to worry about it. So when we're passing out material or doing some outreach, don't use this as an excuse not to do it. Don't be afraid. Be encouraged that this is a promise. This is examples in Scripture. Check out this example. Exodus chapter 4, 10 to 13. You have Moses. Look what Moses did, how God used Moses. But here's Moses' excuse in Exodus chapter 4, 10 to to 13 the 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 father is revealing all these things that he wants Moses to do and then in verse 10 Moses says unto Yahuwah or the Lord O my master I am not eloquent neither heretofore nor since thou hast spoken unto thy servant but I am slow of speech and of a slow tongue and Yahuwah or the Lord said unto him who hath made man's mouth or who maketh the de- dumb or the deaf, of s- or the seeing or the blind? Have not I, Yahuwah, or the Lord? Verse 12, Now therefore go, and I will be with thy mouth, and teach thee what thou shalt say. Verse 13, And he said, O my master, I send, I pray thee, by the hand of him whom thou wilt send. So, here you have Moses. After everything, Moses is now saying, I can't. I, I, he's making an excuse like I'm not eloquent of speech. You know, th- I, I believe here this is where, you know, most likely he, he was nervous. I mean, the father chose him to do a great work. And he's like, I'm not eloquent of speech. I'm, I'm, I'm slow to speech. I'm slow to the tongue. But then what did the father say? The father asked a rhetorical question. He's like, who makes man's mouth? Like, come on. I'm here. In verse 12, he gives a promise. 
Go, therefore, now therefore go, I will be with your mouth and teach thee what to say. Now, sadly, we see later on that that Moses still was a little bit, you know, so the father had to instill Aaron. But the father spoke to Moses, Moses spoke to Aaron, and Aaron then made it audible. Um, but you see later on in progression, Mo- Moses didn't have that issue anymore. Moses is the one who did uh, all the talking. But in this instant, you see that the father used Moses. Moses gave an excuse of slow speech and a slow tongue. But the father is like, do you not trust me? I made man's mouth. Like verse 12, go, I will be with thy mouth and teach thee what to say. So this, what the Messiah was speaking about, uh, you know, giving us the words and what to say, this is not a new thing. This is not a new concept. This is exactly what the prophets of old was doing. Exactly the same thing. Now, I do want to clear up something. And I think it's important that we do. Um, in Exodus chapter 4, verse 10, some individuals say that Moses had a stutter, uh, a lisp, or, yeah, I think it's a stutter. Uh, well, I'm going to actually throw a kink in the chain here. Um, the scripture says, line upon line, precept upon precept, okay? So when we're looking at scripture and studying and reading, we have to look at context, and we got to go line upon line. So this event, event or personality of the Moses, talking about he had a stutter, I don't find any grounds for. And here's why. Because with another scripture, another scripture that's found in Acts, okay? That's found in Acts. Uh, let me go to it here real quick. Found in Acts chapter 7, verse 22. It says, all right? It says, Moses was a learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and deeds. So, in Exodus chapter 4, verse 10, Moses says, I'm not eloquent of speech and I'm slow to, 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 to talk and slow to, to, slow to the tongue. But you have Paul giving a description that says otherwise. Why? Well, here's, here's, here's where I come in. To, I want to harmonize these two here. Moses, I don't believe, had a stutter. I don't really see any, any um, concrete scriptural evidence for that whatsoever. I see that Moses was general of or a commander uh, in the army of the Egyptians. I see that he was a prince. So princes in Egypt, especially, but I mean, all of our, we all know princes are supposed to be well learned. Okay. They're supposed to be well learned, well educated. So uh, I don't believe that Moses was an unlearned person. I believe when Moses was saying this, it, he was referring to the Hebrew tongue because, again, he spoke Egyptian. Um, I'm sure he spoke Hebrew too, but Egyptian mostly. And then he went into Linus forty for forty years. I mean, I mean, there's a lot of stuff. He's probably he probably wasn't good at speaking Hebrew. Now that's just my opinion on that end. But I can't concur that he did not have a stutter. And the reason why, okay, is because Paul makes it clear that he was mighty in words and in deeds. So it just doesn't make sense that he that that was a situation. Um, so the excuse that Moses is doing is either of two things. One, it was because he didn't. Uh, he wasn't good at the Hebrew tongue, so Aaron was type thing. Or two, um, he was just giving an excuse um, for the situation. Uh, but either way, we see the outcome that Moses submitted himself and did what the father wanted. Uh, but this is, again, uh, we shouldn't worry about what we're going to say. We shouldn't worry about it. He will be with our mouth. He will be with our lips. Okay? So, and don't let that nervousness, like if Moses was nervous at this point and said, oh, no, I can't go, um, don't be nervous. Don't allow that nervousness to stop you from doing the work of the Father. Don't don't let it hinder the work at all. So outreach is very important. Otherwise, we wouldn't be the two servants with the talents that are being multiplied in 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 the parable. So here's an example, okay, given in Exodus chapter four. Perfect example with the tidbit in Acts chapter seven, showing that he was mighty in words. So here's an example where you have Moses, a uh, little bit iffy, giving an excuse trying to wiggle himself out of there, but the father is like, no. And this is what we should always remember as well. When I'm scared, I do this. When I'm nervous, when I'm going to speak, when I'm going to hand out material and talk to people on the street, I say that. I say, who man made, who made man's mouth? Who made it? I'll say it too. I'll say it like this. Who made man's mouth, Wes? Who made it? He will talk. Don't worry. And I say that. And we should we should practice this. This is a promise because it's not just for Moses. It wasn't just for Paul. It wasn't just for the 12 disciples. It was also in Jeremiah. 
Let's go to Jeremiah. Jeremiah, I believe it's uh, Jeremiah chapter 1. Jeremiah chapter 1, and it's verse uh, 8 and 9. 8 and 9. Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 8 and 9. Actually, no, we're going to read uh, we're going to read from 5, 5 to 9. Because you, you have, uh, Jeremiah is being summoned as well, right? You're being summoned as well. So here in Jeremiah, it says, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew you. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified you. And I ordained you as a prophet. Then said I, O Yahuwah God, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a child. But Yahuwah, or the Lord, said unto me, Say not, I am a child, for thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee, and whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. Be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee to deliver thee, saith Yahuwah, or the Lord. Verse 9, Then Yahuwah, or the Lord, put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And Yahuwah said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. So again, the perfect example, Jeremiah, prophet, sent to go do a message and the father is the one putting words in his mouth we don't need to worry about this don't let this bar you from doing the work now check this out in here jeremiah was a child and what does the father say what does the father say don't say i'm i am just a child for thou shalt go to all that i shall send thee and whatsoever i command thee thou shalt speak just because you're young a youth a child doesn't mean you can't do the work of God and don't allow that to hinder you in outreach. Youth, those who are young listening right now, don't be like me. Whereas when I was younger, I did not do much outreach at all because I was scared and I was young and I was like, why would adults listen to me? Don't say that. The Father makes it clear in verse 7 in chapter 1 of Jeremiah. Don't say that I'm just a child. Don't do that. You also have the same ministry given to everyone else. So give it. Give it. Multiply those talents. Multiply them. Don't be afraid. Don't use these, this situation or these situations as an excuse not to do the work. Not to do outreach. And you don't need to talk smart. We already went over that. We don't need to talk smart. Now, another thing I want to make it very clear. Now, we need to remember when we're doing outreach, when we're giving the word, uh, when we're giving this ministry of reconciliation to other individuals and passing out material or, or on podcasts or on uh, YouTube or videos, television, whenever we're doing outreach like that, we need to remember, okay, we need to remember where we came from, where we were. Because when we're talking to an individual, I w I'm talking to them because I want to save them. I want to bring them to the Messiah. I want them to experience what I'm experiencing. I want them to have eternal life. I'm not doing it just to toot my own horn. And also when I'm speaking to them, for instance, uh, the individual I, I said in uh, on the December 12th uh, rally in Washington, D.C. when we're passing off books... One of the things, biggest thing, reasons why I was against being provoked was the fact that I was looking at him as, as myself, someone in darkness, someone who does not understand. So I took that into account because I wish, and just like how the Father had mercy, and I wish that certain people had mercy on me, I wish they did that when I was in that state of darkness. I know the Father had mercy on me, but I do know other individuals, especially those who are in ministry, did not have mercy on me. So I wanted to do the same. And here's an example. If we go to Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3, starting at verse 3, going to 6. We have a perfect example. And I think we need to, rem to remember. Okay? We need to remember. Um, actually, let's read 2 all the way to 6. It says, To speak evil... Of no man to be no brawlers or no fighters, but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But after 
that the kindness of the love of God our Savior toward men appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to the mercy He saved us, by the washing of, washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which He shed on us abundantly through Yahushua the Messiah, or Jesus Christ our Savior. So, I love this in verse 3. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived. See how we need to be self-examining ourselves and remember when we're, when we're giving out the word. We shouldn't be speaking evil about it, about people. We shouldn't be fighters. We should be gentle. We'd be showing meekness. We should be showing mercy. Reminding ourselves when we're speaking to individuals not to be upset, not to be angry. Because we were once in their position. I was in a position where I wanted I wanted nothing to do with God. Basically, I just didn't want a Bible. I didn't want to do anything. Nothing. I didn't want to read. Nothing. So when someone asked me something, don't want to be a part of it. You want to do a Bible study? Don't want to be a part of it. I was there. I was foolish. I was disobedient. I was deceived. I was serving my diverse lusts and pleasures. I was living in every bit of darkness. I was hateful. Let's when we're doing outreach, it's really important that we remember where we came from. It's rem remember because just like how the Father came to us, because out of love, out of mercy, out of the desire to have us within the fold, desire to give us eternal life, we should also do the same to other individuals. Have mercy upon them too. We shouldn't just write them off and reject them. We should go to them. Just because, like, for instance, we shouldn't be respecter of persons, just like the Father's not respecter of persons. I'm not going to go and say, I, I want this group because, you know, they, these guys are, or let's say, these guys are black, so I'm going to go to them. Or these guys are white, I'm going to go to them. These guys are Jewish, I'm only going to go. We should be going to everyone. Everyone. We shouldn't be a respecter of persons. Whether they're rich, whether they're poor, whether it's skin color, we should be going to everyone. Everyone, whether they're more sinful than these people, whether they look scarier than these people, we should be going to everyone because we also been in darkness. And we should remind ourselves that because it, I, I now look at it and go, I want people to experience what I experienced. I want them to have the feeling of never being alone. I want them to have the Spirit of God that I'm always comforted. I want them to have the ability to not be stressed over burdens, but to give everything to the Messiah. I want them to have the ability not to fear death. These are the things we need to keep in our mind when we're doing outreach. So these, in, in, in conclusion, these are the things that people do that makes them fear, fear to do outreach. They make them afraid to do it. They make people... <laughs> uh, depressed to do it for instance people worry about rejection don't worry about that people worry about what to say don't worry about that don't fear these things don't be discouraged by them don't be depressed if people reject you persecute and hate you so what if you like for instance if I passed out 3,400 books which is what we calculated if only one person reads that and gives their life to the messiah I did the work. The Messiah did the work through me. That's all that's needed. That's all that was needed. The work was done. One person. For one person, the work was done. Don't be discouraged that you see the books laying on the floor. Flyers and booklets and studies. Even Bibles that you pass out. Or that when you talk to someone and they get upset with you. Now, when you talk to someone, they would completely reject you. Don't be discouraged. You're planting a seed. And if just one person comes back from that, or the person who rejected you takes a year later, which happened by, by example with me, experience, that it took a year for someone to understand full rejection when I showed truth in Scripture. And then a year later, a year later, get a, get a, get a, a, a reach out saying that I was right. Not I was right, but the Scripture was right. And that they were wrong to say certain things to me. Don't be discouraged. Keep doing the work. It's worth it that one soul, one person saved in, that, in those efforts. It's so worth it. And remember as well, don't be scared. It is not you doing the work. 
It is the Father through the Messiah using you to do it. So you have the strength of the Father. You have the power. You have the Spirit. You have the words. Through Him, you have the words. So don't fear to do outreach. Okay? Don't be afraid. Don't let that fear, that nervousness discourage you and bar you from doing the work that we are told to do. And please do not be the lukewarm or the individual with the one talent in the parable in the book of Matthew where they did not, uh, 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 they did not gain any more talents. They just stuck on what they had and never went out and was useless. Don't be like those individuals because Scripture is very clear. They are tossed out into darkness. Like lukewarm, they're spewed out. So I encourage, uh, I encourage you to do outreach, whether any form, whether if it's street preaching, passing out material, uh, uh, doing studies online, um, talking to your family, talking to your friends, talking to people on the street, whatever means, do the work. God called us to give a message, the message of reconciliation. He calls us representative, ambassadors, preachers, ministers to reconciliation. We must do this work. We must share. We must We must follow. So, I encourage you to do the work. And I am thankful that you came and joined us today so that we can go over this study. Uh, the fear of outreach is what I'm going to call it. Um, there's so much more verses. So, I really encourage you to go and study this for yourself. Don't take my word for it, okay? Go and study it for yourselves. The Bible says to prove all things. The word prove means to test. So what I'm saying, go and test it in scriptures yourselves. Go and test your scripture yourselves. Okay, go and study these things. There's so much more verses. I can't use them all because it will just be such a long study, a long episode. But it's such a pleasure. And don't be discouraged. Okay, don't be discouraged. Be encouraged. Do the work. Do it. It's worth it. It's worth it. Okay, so... Uh, I encourage uh, everyone to do some outreach uh, at least this week or or today if you, or whenever you're listening to this to go do some outreach to to do it in prayer uh, to do it faithfully. I also encourage you to go and study this yourselves and I just want to uh, also say that we'll be planning to do more material outreach and giving out some study guides and study books and stuff like that and we would really need some volunteers to help. Uh, whether financially or in person. Uh, there's some more rallies coming up. Uh, but stay in tune. We're going to post it on the website or on Facebook. But I appreciate you guys uh, joining the study. And until next time, stay in the scriptures, stay in the word. God bless you. Godspeed. Amen.